Randy, so much for that introduction. It's been it's been a wonderful day so far. I've had uh, a lot of great meetings with, with folks, and I'm really really excited to be here and share some of my work. Uh, like Dr. Kramer said, I'm a clinical psychologist by by training, and I focus primarily in the area of uh, of traumatic stressors. I've done some work in, in some different different contexts, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a just a second. The title of my talk is the role of social resources. Uh, in the context of diversity, explorations in low and middle income countries. So in terms of an outline of the talk, I'm going to first uh, discuss a brief uh, background. Uh, I'll talk about previous research. I'll mention three different studies that I've been involved with that have measured uh, social resources in these, in these contexts. And then I'll uh, conclude uh, with a couple summary points about that. And then uh, conclude the talk with my pivot towards Asia and describe just really briefly what, I, what I'm going to be doing uh, with regard to the African migrant community in Guangzhou. So first, global mental health is an exciting area uh, to be a part of because we have an opportunity through addressing mental health concerns globally to really address uh, a major source of disability adjusted life years population. And what I have here is the um, is the top top ranking of uh, mental health problems that are related to disability adjusted life years uh, uh, that's been identified. And the grand challenges in global mental health uh, was, a, was a, a project initiative that was started to address uh, what was deemed to be the most important areas of, uh, of um, uh, to be addressed in, in global mental health, the grand challenges of global mental health. And if we were to address these challenges, we'd be able to make a, a real impact health populations. They identified six different goals, and what I did is pull out four of the goals that I think are most complementary to the work that I've done or the directions that I'm, I'm going to take with my research. And so the first is to identify uh, root causes and risk of protective factors uh, for mental, mental health problems. And the work that I've done is to identify modifiable social, social risk factors and understand the impacts of poverty, uh, violence, war, migration, and disaster. And these are the uh, individual individual challenges that were uh, that were identified under this under this goal. The second is to advance prevention and implementation of early interventions, and in, under this goal um, is to support community environments that promote uh, promote mental health. And I think through understanding the social connections of people in their environments, you could uh, you could start to develop preventative intervention strategies. The next is to improve treatments and expand access to care. And uh, under this, one of the top uh, top goals is to develop effective treatments for use of non-specialists, including lay mental health workers. And under this under this uh, goal, I, I was actually able to uh, travel to the Democratic Republic uh, of, of the Congo to train lay psychosocial assistants in the provision of cognitive behavioral therapy intervention. And through that, and, and also I taught a course in Macau, China, on cognitive behavioral intervention. So I've had some experience. Uh, in, in terms of training populations that don't have advanced degrees and, and, and are able to carry out those interventions so with great effect. And also to raise the, the awareness of the global burden. And under this under this goal is to develop a, a valid and reliable definitions, models, and measurement tools uh, for assessment. And I spent some time doing that, especially on my postdoc, uh, looking at uh, culturally relevant, contextually specific uh, mental health concerns in different populations and how to adapt measures uh, that are that have, uh, <coughs> been used in other contexts uh, in, in, these, in these different different places. There's a shortage of, of, of mental health uh, care providers globally, and, and uh, this has led to a large treatment gap in China in particular. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's some estimates are 17,000 psychiatrists for a population of 1.4 billion people. Which is, is obviously uh, 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 relates to a great a great need uh, in in the population uh, in terms of global health. Social resources might have to, to harness the the um, abilities of the community in terms of, of their ability to heal themselves and to understand what protective factors exist within the community, especially social resources, uh, might go a long way in identifying. Uh, other strategies aside from cognitive behavioral interventions that can help, although they've been shown to be quite effective. And so social resources are defined uh, by many related terms and, and concepts. And just uh, uh, briefly, social resources are accessed through an individual social connection. So these are resources that we share uh, between people, the connections that we have 
uh, to other to other folks. And um, one of the one of the most um, most readily studied uh, social resources, and social support, and it's particularly emotional support in the context of adversity. So, uh, if a person has had uh, to, to measure the availability or the perceived availability of support in their in their social environment, social integration and social cohesion uh, have also been also been measured, and that's the degree to which an individual uh, is embedded within their social context. And also social networks. And social network analysis allows for a more nuanced approach of understanding how many people are in your social network, what types of uh, support provision uh, are available to you uh, from those people, how dense your network is, meaning how many people know each other in your network. And this, this social network kind of analysis allows for, uh, in, in different contexts, will allow for a better measurement of the social resources that exist in different places. There is a recognition of the importance to accurately measure and define these resources. In a recent study, uh, Baumgartner and Susser suggest there is no one one measure of social resources that can be applied in all different contexts, and that's and that's true both in, in terms of of, uh, of uh, uh, social resources, but also in, in terms of mental health. And, and so there's a problem uh, to identify the relationship ties and important uh, relationship dynamics that exist in different contexts. It might not be the same. Uh, in, in, in rural Uganda as it would be in, in Ethiopia. And it's similar to mental health. So there's local idioms of distress and, and symptoms that are experienced in different cultures. And I spent a lot of time on my, on my postdoctoral fellowship, especially in a project that I've done uh, in Ethiopia with, uh, actually with Dee Puffer, who's a part of your, part of your faculty, at, uh, conducting a validity study uh, to uh, identify locally relevant uh, symptoms and adapt measures to measure those symptoms. Within, uh, within uh, refugee communities in Ethiopia. So a solution is, is using mixed methods approaches. It could be that you know using formative research to identify first what the needs are of the community, what, what their mental health concerns are, what their important social dynamics are, and social supports are, and then uh, developing measures that uh, that will particularly measure those 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 issues in that community. To borrow from social epidemiology, uh, there's social selection and social causation. Uh, social selection uh, indicates that higher levels of social resources might buffer uh, against the, the, uh, the stresses of adversity. And that's been shown in a variety of different studies. For example, in a study that we did uh, in the context of political violence, individuals who had uh, higher levels of social support had less uh, psychological distress, which led to fewer problems with self-reported health. Uh, it was found in sexual trauma, so individuals who had people to listen to them to talk about their, their experiences of sexual violence had fewer symptoms of post-traumatic stress. But in the same context, if people gave, uh, uh, <coughs> people had rejecting attitudes towards those individuals, they had higher levels of mental health uh, problems. It's been shown in the, in the context of migration as well, discrimination. And a meta-analysis uh, came out in 2000 that looked at all the different types of risk and protective factors for post-traumatic stress and showed that lack of social support was the, was the key uh, ingredient for post-traumatic stress disorder, indicating that the post-recovery environment, the social context, really matters quite a lot. In terms of social causation and social drift, exposure to adversity and higher levels of distress can also decrease social resources. And this is a an alternate kind of pathway that isn't really as, as as often studied. It has been studied in the context of natural disasters and also in our research group we looked at it uh, with, with regard to terrorism as well. And that is exposure to adversity and mental health problems can actually lead to losses in social resources. And this is illustrated by a study that was done in 2008 with Kaniaski and Norris that showed that initially <coughs> um, so this, this was a study that was done uh, for folks who had experienced um, a natural disaster in Mexico. And so they began uh, measuring PTSD and social support six months after the disaster. And then they followed them every six months thereafter. They found that between six and 12 month follow-up, we see that social support was protected for mental health problems, for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. But at 12 months to 18 month follow-up, as PTSD uh, remained a, a salient issue in the community, we see that PTSD started enacting a negative uh, uh, effect on social support, such that individuals who had higher levels of post-traumatic stress had lower levels of social support at a subsequent uh, study time period. Uh, social support was still protected, however, during this, uh, <coughs> during this measurement uh, window. 
However, during 18 months and 24 month follow up, we see that post traumatic stress becomes uh, post traumatic stress becomes more salient here. Uh, social support no longer has a protective benefit against uh, mental health problems later on, <coughs> but social support is now being eroded by post traumatic stress. And this is just a nice illustrative example of how these processes could, could unfold over time. The first study I want to talk about that we did, we did a study in the Palestinian uh, Authority. And uh, this group has been um, oppressed by a variety of different uh, social political uh, concerns for, for, for quite, quite some time. During the first and second intifada, 6,200 uh, Palestinians were killed, uh, 60,000 wounded, and another 65,000 uh, were detained. So what we wanted to do in this study was to measure the trajectories of mental health symptoms over time and then to uh, evaluate what the uh, risk and protective factors were for those, the long and those different trajectories. Bonanno in 2004 identified prototypical patterns of, of response following different types of adversity. Um, the take home message from this slide is that although people experience um, really uh, distressing events in their lives, the majority of those individuals do not go on to have post-traumatic stress disorder. And actually, it, it's, it's actually a, a minority of people that have those kinds of uh, negative psychic thought, pathological reactions. And the most, um, the resilient reactions are actually the most, uh, the most common. So people uh, end up having <coughs> a slight degree of psychopathology or, or a little, little uh, uptick in, in symptoms but then over the, life, over the, over the time, um, they don't tend to have uh, difficulty with, with their functioning. We also have uh, a chronic group, so there are a minority of folks that experience uh, major life trauma that do have chronic levels of psychopathology over time. There's also a delayed group, uh, people that initially don't have a, a great degree of psychopathology, but over time will develop it. And then this recovered group, so people that initially have high levels of distress but then over time recover to a, essentially a pre-morbid level of, of, of health and functioning. So this was a longitudinal study uh, conducted the three follow-up waves six months apart. We initiated this in October 2007, and that was two years after the second Defada. So, uh, so exposure was was lower during this during this period of time. There was still a threat of ongoing violence that occurred. At 764 Palestinian adults living in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Um, and this sample comprised 64% of the roughly 1,200 people that we had in our baseline, baseline sample. Uh, sampling was conducted using a three-stage uh, random stratified sampling uh, method. Half the sample was, was female, uh, 35 years of age on average, uh, about 70% were, were married. The data analytic uh, strategy we used was latent growth mixture modeling, which is a, a way of understanding if you have heterogeneity in your population. So rather than looking at just means, which can, um, which can mask different, uh, different <coughs> populations that, that occur, this latent growth mixture model actually teases apart different types of trajectories that would occur. So some people might, like I showed in the prototypical trajectory, some people might have a high chronic level of distress, and other people might have different other patterns. Uh, <coughs> this technique will, will allow it, allow that to be shown. We also looked at multinomial logistic regressions to explore the different predictors uh, of those trajectories. We measured political violence with three different items, and that was whether or not a person had a death of a family member or friend uh, in the past year, injury to a family member or friend or to oneself, and witnessing political violence. And we measured loss to psychosocial and material resources uh, with a 10 item uh, scale, and just for a couple example items. So uh, to what degree have you lost stability of your family since the Intifada? or intimacy with at least one friend, or your sense of hope since the intifada began. We also measured social support satisfaction and availability from friends and family. Post-traumatic stress disorder was measured with a 17-item scale, uh, PTSD uh, symptom scale uh, interview. So we identified three different latent trajectories of, of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. We see that um, the most commonly occurring was a moderate improving trajectory, where people had uh, had some symptoms, but they improved over time. Uh, we had a chronic, uh, severe chronic group <coughs> that maintained their symptoms uh, over time, and a severe improving group, which was the uh, less least uh, frequent uh, occurring uh, trajectory. So in terms of measuring 
uh, measuring the predictors of those different trajectories, we see that uh, individuals who were in the moderate improving group, so people who were in this group versus people who were in the severe chronic group, they had lower levels of exposure to political violence. They also reported uh, greater levels of resource loss at time one, so at this period of time they reported experiencing more of, of, of that loss, which might be counterintuitive, but I, I'd like to explain that by thinking that uh, individuals who maintain the severe chronic trajectory might have actually had fewer resources to lose. So compared to these other groups, they started in a different, a different place. We also see that, that individuals in this moderate improving group uh, uh, reported less resource loss at time two and at time three, essentially tracking their symptoms over time. And that these folks also had higher levels of social support to begin with. So they were already starting from a different, uh, a, a different point, suggesting a stress buffering effect. With regard to the severe improvement group, so this group here versus the severe chronic group, we see that uh, individuals again had less exposure to uh, traumatic stress. They had higher levels of resource loss, and their resource loss at time two and time three essentially tracked their symptoms. So they had less resource loss here and here than did the severe chronic group. So in summary, no delayed symptom uh, group is identified. The majority of the sample remained symptomatic throughout, uh, throughout the entire study period. A uh, resilient group did not emerge. There was no group in this study uh, that had uh, no symptoms or low, low levels of symptoms throughout uh, the study period. So support did play a key role in the, in the moderate improving trajectory, suggesting that stress buffering effect. And continued losses to resources predicted uh, be in the more severe categories, but again, not at these level. So in the next study that I'm going to talk about, we did uh, we looked at um, a study of Kurdish torture survivors, and during the Saddam Hussein regime, there was uh, about 182,000 Kurds were killed, and during during the, the Amfal campaign, <coughs> and 5,000 killed uh, uh, Kurds were killed during the Halabja uh, uh, gas massacre, which was the, the worst event in that period of time. Uh, the study aim was to evaluate the role of mental health symptoms or problems and uh, associated losses with social resources over time. So as a longitudinal study, it was five months uh, with a five-month follow-up uh, frame. Uh, data was obtained from a randomized uh, clinical trial for torture survivors, um, and so this was the, the control group, uh, weightless control of uh, participants. So we were able to measure naturalistic changes uh, over time without, uh, without <coughs> effective intervention. Um, we used the Hopkins, Hopkins uh, symptom checklist uh, to measure depression and anxiety symptoms. Uh, but here there was formative work that went into the study design uh, and adaptation of measures. So what we have here is five qualitative items that were particular to that context that were measured and included in this, uh, in this assessment. Uh, we measure PTSD symptoms with the Harvard Trauma Questionnaire. Uh, again, two qualitative items were, were added based on the formative work, uh, and also traumatic grief uh, using the inventory of traumatic grief. We measured social resources with seven different items that felt fall along uh, three different dimensions of social resources. The first being social integration. Um, I have people with whom I can, can do enjoyable things. I feel like I belong in my community. I'm very <coughs> happy. I'm happy with the friendships that I have. Um, the next was uh, contact with social networks, so how frequently an individual um, has contact with their social network uh, with regard to friends and other families. And social support. Um, so in a crisis, I would have the support I need from family or friends. Um, I know people who will listen to me and understand me if I need to talk. We assessed uh, changes in these social resources uh, with, uh, di by dichotomizing these different measures. We subtracted time one, or rather time two from time one to get a change score. We used the standard deviation at baseline uh, to then assess whether or not a person has had no measurable change, so if they fell within one standard deviation, uh, plus, or, uh, plus or minus zero, or whether or not they had greater than one standard deviation, less than, than zero, uh, which indicated that they had lost that resource. <coughs> We then followed this with logistic regression analysis, looking at the outcomes. Uh, each social resource was regressed separately on baseline symptoms, but then also the change in those symptoms. So whether or not a person had increased between baseline and five-month follow-up with any of these uh, so, uh, mental health measures. So social integration uh, was reported lost by about 16% of our sample. Um, 
about 10% of our sample reported less frequent contact with their social supports, and about 8% of the sample reported less uh, social support uh, availability. With regard to our, our logistic regression analysis, we found that individuals <coughs> at, at baseline, so their depression, PTSD, and traumatic grief, were all related to loss in social integration. So that's interpreted such that an individual with one point increase on their depression scale at baseline was uh, related to a 14% increase in the odds that they would lose a social integration by five month follow up. This pattern of results was not explained by increases in symptoms, so it wasn't just that they got worse over time, uh, but it was actually where they started from that, that, that mattered in these analyses. In the next set here, we see that baseline symptoms did not predict loss of social contact, but the increase in anxiety or PTSD did predict the loss uh, in social contact. And finally, with regard to predicting loss in social support, none of our baseline measures of mental health or the changes in mental health symptoms over time were predicted uh, of these losses. So in summary, baseline symptoms of depression, PTSD, and grief were associated with loss of social integration. This was not accounted for by changes in these, in these symptoms. Um, but it does highlight the potential consequence of not treating people with mental health, uh, mental health issues, that um, mental health is related dynamically to social resources over time. Um, and this is, this is true even 20 years after their experience of, of their traumatic life events that they're reporting and linking these symptoms back to. So even, even this, this far, uh, far along, uh, it seems like symptoms and, and social resources are, are very much associated. So interventions to improve uh, mental health might also have the impact, might also have an impact on social resources. And actually, I've, I've done an analysis in, in the DRC looking at an intervention uh, designed to affect mental health and to find that as mental health decreased social resources, or actually social capital in the study can improve. So in the final study I'm going to talk about, uh, we, we did a study in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, that looked at social and physical functioning among those with probably, probably PTSD. As you all know, uh, DRC has experienced a, a great deal of, of, of trauma uh, over time. So in, in November of 2006, during a period of relative calm, uh, a local N NGO, MedAir, uh, did a psychosocial uh, assessment of mental health problems that were occurring in Benia, uh, Oriental province in DRC. Uh, they conducted in-person interviews uh, privately uh, people were approached in the town to, uh, for them to participate. And recruit, recruitment was balanced across the full different sectors of town based on, on gender. Measured probable PTSD diagnosis using the uh, composite, in, in the sort of composite uh, international diagnostic interview. And functional impairment, social and physical disabilities was measured using the 12 item uh, World Health Organization uh, disability assessment scale, which measured six different uh, activity domains. Uh, understanding, communicating, uh, getting around, self-care, getting along with others, household and work activities, and participation in society. So it does tap into six different different domains. Whether or not they are the most salient in the population, uh, we don't know. So the population was uh, we did it. There was a balance <coughs> between men, men and women in, in the different in the different uh, area. And there's also balance between uh, age and marital status as well. And it, it, with regard to the traumatic events that were experienced, on average, individuals reported experiencing five different traumatic events. Um, there were differences noted between men and women with regard to the type of tra trauma, uh, trauma experience they had, with women uh, being more likely to report rape or sexual molestation in their lives, and um, men more likely to report being threatened, uh, held, kidnapped, or, or tortured. Post traumatic stress disorder was was quite prevalent with 40% of the overall uh, population receiving this probable PTSD diagnosis. Uh, with women, at least half, half women reported having uh, symptoms consistent with a probable PTSD diagnosis, and 29% of, of men. With regard to the data, data analytic approaches, we use logistic regression, again, uh, with each functioning item progressed uh, from the WHODAS progress on PTSD diagnosis and independent samples t-test to assess continuous outcomes uh, as well. So this, this slide is basically showing, it's a forest plot that's showing the different <coughs> ratios uh, for experiencing a variety of these different physical and, uh, and social functioning outcomes. 
uh, washing, washing whole body, getting dressed, learning a new task, and walking a long distance didn't, weren't, weren't statistically significantly different between those that had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and those that didn't. But we see, I'd like to just highlight these three different outcomes. Um, that is dealing with people you do not know, maintaining a friendship, and the highest odds was uh, related to joining a community activities. And that is that individuals with PTSD compared to those that didn't uh, were six times, of, uh, had six times the odds of having problems joining in their community activities, suggesting that post-traumatic stress disorder uh, was an important, uh, was an important differentiating factor between people's ability to function or not. Um, in terms of continuous outcomes, we looked at probable PTSD and then folks without probable PTSD, and we found that um, individuals who rated their overall health uh, more uh, lower if they had PTSD, they had more difficulty, uh, more total disability. Um, they reported those difficulties interfering with their life more often. They had um, uh, the number of days of disability was was nine versus uh, versus roughly two for those that didn't have PTSD, <coughs> getting quite a burden uh, on their on their daily lives. Uh, the number of days they cut back to reduce their usual activities was, was also statistically significantly higher with three versus about one. And the number of days not able to carry out the usual activities at all was about five versus one. So social resources, in, 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 in summary, social resources are important, uh, important protective factors. Um, understanding the types of resources in different, in different contexts is important and it's something that, that's, that, that could be relevant for, for my future work and something I'd like to continue to pursue. Um, even those endowed with social resources, however, have the opportunity to lose those resources. And as they're lost, um, given the relationship between social supports and, and symptoms, we can see that a person who loses those supports might spiral uh, into further losses and greater uh, levels of psychopathology. So why is mental health associated with, with losses to social resources? There's a variety of different possible mechanisms that I think would be interesting to, to explore. Uh, some of them are specific to the types of the, uh, types of disorders that I've already described. So, for example, uh, individuals with anxiety and post-traumatic stress might avoid social contact <coughs> situations that might remind them of their traumas, and that avoidance could lead to, uh, to, to uh, less availability of support. They might have lack of social interest or more irritability, more irritability and difficulties with their mood, for example, if they have depressive symptoms. Uh, social conflict might, might also be related uh, symptoms by overwhelmed social network. So what, what's not really clear is how much a person can be relied upon before they're no longer able to give support uh, as support is transactional. And also there might be cognitive distortion. So if, when you have uh, difficulties with mental health problems, you might have different distortions. For example, emotional reasoning suggesting I feel alone, therefore I must not have any support when in fact support is actually available and they just can't see it. Uh, and stigma is also a large problem uh, as well. So people with mental health problems might be stigmatized and people would avoid actually having contact with them. So with regard to, um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about work that I, I'm, I'm going to be doing uh, in China um, and how this kind of began actually. So it, my pivot towards Asia began uh, with, a recent, with a trip toward, to Japan uh, following the earthquake that happened. Uh, uh, I went in 2011 with a team from the Medical University of South Carolina where we conducted trainings uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder treatment among those who are community providers. I continued when I taught a course in Macau, China in June of 2012, and there I realized there was a high level of stigma associated with mental health symptoms, especially in China, and that there's a lack of evidence-based mental health care treatments that were uh, widely being disseminated, indicating there was a great need for an individual to, to, uh, to make that difference in that, in that context. And it continues because I think China is a fascinating context for public health, uh, public health work with rapid urbanization, natural disaster, disasters, issues with uh, non communicable diseases such as uh, obesity and uh, tobacco. And there's also migration, both internal and international. Uh, so the work that I'm going to be conducting is, is to look at the social networks of African migrants that, that live in, in Guangzhou, China. So as of 2000, uh, more formalized relations between China and African countries has led to a in, great increase in both uh, migration from China to Africa, but then also a less studied area, which is uh, African mi migration to, to China. Um, trade is estimated at 20 billion, and now um, China is the largest uh, trading partner <coughs> with, uh, uh, 
with, with Africa, uh, U.S. was, was formally <coughs> that, that role. There's a 30 to 40 percent uh, increase in migration uh, annually to one to Guangzhou, China. And there's an estimated between 20,000 uh, folks with visas and up to 100,000 that are be, that, that end up overstaying their visas and stay there uh, illegally. And the majority are from from Nigeria. There is adversity in the African migrant migration experience, and if you read different uh, different news outlets about this, uh, in 2009, uh, Africans uh, an African was uh, jumped from uh, from an 18-story window uh, with a friend and ended up dying because he was avoiding uh, a, a visa a visa raid by local police authorities. And in 2012, in June, another another Nigerian man died in, in police custody. Uh, following an incident with a, um, uh, a motorbike incident, uh, which prompted uh, protests in the streets in both, in both these incidences. So the community experiences many stressors and, and also health concerns, uh, multiple health and mental health concerns such as alcohol misuse, anxiety, depression, relationship problems, and sexual risk taking STIs. And, and this, this has been known uh, through some initial qualitative uh, formative work and also some anecdotal uh, evidence from folks that, that are collaborators there uh, on the ground. There's also significant back, uh, barriers to access to care in terms of language, legal status, and, and discrimination that's been uncovered as well. And a study that we did recently, um, a qualitative study just trying to understand what uh, different barriers to care exist and then what, uh, what local solutions were to those barriers to care. Uh, we asked the question, what did you do in Guangzhou when you had uh, health care uh, problems? And what I really want to highlight about this slide is that social networks are also important and social resources are also important in this context. We see that 54% uh, of this population relied on ad hoc interpreters, so friends, wives, and, and others to, to help navigate the, uh, the health care environment. And that 22.9% also relied on personal, uh, personal medical connections, either in China or in Africa. Uh, interestingly, there's, uh, they also involve themselves in medical tourism, so they go to, they go to, uh, to Thailand to get their medical, medical needs met, which is a significant uh, financial burden for those groups. So social networks may serve as a buffer against migration stressors. And through formative work, I want to identify what the mental health and substance use uh, problems are uh, of this population, uh, asking, asking a qualitative, uh, asking, uh, conducting for, uh, 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 conducting uh, qualitative interviews about what the problems are that are affecting the, the community, uh, and then also understanding the social social network characteristics. So really, really digging down and asking questions about what type of support is important to you, uh, where do you get your support, and really being able to enumerate how many people are in their social social networks. And through identifying that, we could we could uh, uh, build name generator questions, which will allow us to really formally assess what the social networks are of the African migrant. And after doing that, we want to uh, look at a, qu a quantitative follow-up study to formally assess those network ties and their effects on health. So I have a lot of people to acknowledge. Uh, I've had a lot of folks that have been really helpful and instrumental in my, in my development of my career. So I have many of them listed here. Uh, and also my funding and support from the National Institute of Mental Health, my training fellowship now, and the work uh, in Africa, in China rather, being funded by the Poverty International Center. So I also want to thank all of you for your for your attention. Thanks. No questions, sir. Sorry. Okay, I'm uh, very impressed with the kind of diversity in the research you have been doing across of in terms of uh, the fact that it's all over the world. Uh, who can a, a postdoc have connections in the Palestinian Authority, in Iraq, in Congo, with all the different languages? I know in, in Japan and in, in Asia. Uh, can, can you speak a little to that, how you have gotten into these projects that are somewhat common in terms of the project area, but in terms of the geographical focus and the language issues must be staggering. Uh, Sure. Um, well, I've been fortunate. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my first response is that I've been very lucky to, to work with people that have access to these populations and, and funding to, to do this kind of work. So, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority, was my my doctoral advisor that we did. I was a data analyst and manager for all the projects related to the R1 grant uh, in Israel and the Palestinian Authority. So, uh, it was a lot of work, and we got a lot a lot done together uh, with that. And then in terms of uh, of Japan, I was fortunate on my internship. 
um, we, we had been asked at the Medical University of South Carolina to send a team, and my research preceptor at the time was like, well, you're into this, into this global stuff. Why don't you come with me to, to Japan? Uh, and I was like, all right, why not? So I went, and it was, it was great fun. And so, uh, and then in terms of the Congo, uh, I met up with uh, a research, a colleague at a conference and just started talking with him about different, uh, different opportunities he had. And so I got turned on uh, to the work there. And then also my mentors at, at Hopkins have Literally, they have mental health research projects going on everywhere in the world, and so uh, I've been working with them in Ethiopia and DRC also. So, yeah. so social resources. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the um, work that you're doing with the African migrant community. Sure. Um, are you at all looking at how discrimination in that social context can sort of interface with the social support factors in terms of predicting mental health? It's, it's actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I didn't, I didn't really make that really clear uh, as I was describing that, but it's one of my major major fo focus. It's one of my, ma my major uh, concerns about that population is they're experiencing different types of discrimination. Uh, locally, but again, I feel like before I actually get on the ground and do more formative work to understand that, I can't really make that that association as explicit as I would like, um, because there's a mixture. Uh, I think in the population, some there are about 500 uh, uh, Nigerians that are married to Chinese uh, women, uh, and I, I have that number only because we're working with uh, a local community leader in the Nigerian community. So uh, there's a mixture of different things that are happening in that context. So I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yet how that all play out, but but discrimination as an exposure and social network as the uh, as the effect modifier of mental health is essentially the model that I'm, I'm trying to explore. There. Yeah. Yes. So Brian, I know you're just now starting your pivot and and doing your first project in China, but <coughs> if you were to take the position in DKU and spend several more years in China, yes. Uh, do you have any thoughts about future directions that your research might follow? Well, I'm hoping to, to really build a lot on the collaborations that I'm, I'm initiating now with each other. And so I'm, I'm expecting that, that once I get there, this project will kind of continue to grow and evolve. And so I think migration is, is, a, is a key point, internal migration also. And so I can see my work expanding to, uh, to African communities there, but also they exist in, China, in, in Shanghai and Beijing. And so I can perhaps um, look at these kinds of factors elsewhere. And if we develop a model that could be applicable uh, within that the southern context, perhaps we could look at internal migration and try to apply a different type of uh, uh, discrimination kind of framework to understanding of the home that's existing elsewhere as well. So that's, that's, one, that's one area. Um, I'm also interested in obesity. I've done some work in that area as well. And so I can see partnering with folks to understand uh, the role of trauma. So for example, individuals who have psychological trauma have uh, difficulties with sleep. But sleep is related to a uh, uh, functioning related to obesity also. So there might be a pathway or a model that we could develop looking at uh, trauma, sleep, and obesity. So something I've been thinking about also. Yes. Yeah, you spoke a little bit about sort of some training you've done for healthcare providers and the task around the task shifting. Yes. Is, um, so it just made me think is intervention research and focus sort of on your radar um, and, a, and a direction you want to go? Sure. It is, actually. Um, I'm, I'm interested in trying to develop more social network-oriented <laughs> interventions. Um, I don't have experience doing that, but I've partnered with uh, Carl Atkin at, at Hopkins, and he's done a lot of work with injection drug users and developing uh, network-based interventions. So if there's a person who uh, is influential in their community, you could, you could teach them different uh, health, um, give them different health messages to spread in their community, and at least at the end of one level, at that person level, they see differences within their, their mental health and also their sexual risk taking behavior uh, and injection drug use behavior. So um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to engage more in, 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 in that, kind of, that kind of work. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like. Uh, very fascinated by this uh, study with the Africans in, um, in China. And one thing that to me is very important when it comes to social integration is of course communication and very, very basic in terms of language. Right. 
I mean, just uh, what language is the language of communication there between the people in that region of China and um, the Nigerians and the researcher, which is primarily English speaking? Right. Because I'm also going to be a migrant, right? Yeah. So, 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 so it's kind of an interesting yeah. context, and, and I, I'm learning Mandarin now, but uh, I have very limited working proficiency. Um, they're speaking uh, primarily uh, English. They do have other native languages, like Nigeria has several other native languages, um, uh, but the language of communication is English, and they are learning some Cantonese, uh, but language is definitely a barrier. It's, a, it's a definitely a barrier not only to health healthcare, but, but just, just generally as a stressor of being in that context about having the, the language proficiency. I mean, you may want to directly measure that, because that could yes. be kind of like a covariate or a moderator or something like that that could be uh, very important in this context. Uh, here we have a look at an actual acculturation, which of course has many dimensions, but it also measures as language. So we may really want to make that not just a problem, but make it kind of like an interesting research question here. Yeah. How important is language mm -hmm. integration? No, I think that's, that's actually a really good point. I think, too, that really touches upon another area that it could be that there's a strong ethnic solidarity. So I might yeah. find that, that those networks are quite dense and people are relying on each other quite a lot. But to what degree individuals in this community are relying on local Chinese and integrating themselves within the local, the local structure might be uh, at least partially mediated by, by language proficiency. Yeah. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, the slide where you uh, have the longitudinal PTSD change in directions of social support. I don't remember which one I'm talking about. Okay. Where the, um, where social support is initially protected, at least the way I interpreted what you were saying, that you may um, have uh, lesser development of PTSD when you had a socially when you had social resources. Yes. Yet over time, the direction went the other way, right? I mean, that once you, if you, if, yeah, that'd be, yeah, sure. Um, I want to make sure I understood this because for me, it sort of sets the stage for at least the way I put yeah. it. Part of the rationale for why to intervene with social resources. So it is kind of okay. an intervention, future intervention I development. Would, I appreciate question. it. Um, yes. So I just wanted to be sure. I mean, I find this really interesting. So I was trying to think about what this means for intervention, depending on where you are in right. relation to the experience of the stressor. Is it? Was the one? Was there the remember the very beginning in the back? The arrows with the arrows. It was the time back. It was part of was one of us. The typical trajectory is it wasn't this. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> what's going on? Okay. You know why? Because it's not my study. I mean, so maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but I mean, this is consistent, I think, with the way we approach some of this, which is we know that whether someone is avoiding or what they have for social resources at the onset may have. Uh, may result in less severe traumatic symptoms, sure. which is what I think you were saying is what you found in the beginning, right? right? Yes. Um, but when you looked over time, the way I heard what you were saying mm -hmm. is that once basically, I assume what this means is if PTSD sort of maintains at that level of right. grade two, then it basically has a negative relationship with social support, probably because of the, if you think of it dynamically, from the behavior of the individual with the PTSD, sure. right? right? And so it's, and yeah. I heard of it as sort of eventually it's negatively related because the social support goes away, mm -hmm. right? That's right? So so what I was thinking then is, well, if one wants to intervene on social resources, mm -hmm. uh, obviously I think that it's pretty clear how to do that in the beginning if you mm -hmm. can have increased social support or social, mm -hmm. uh, social whichever social aspect you use. But, I, but it's, it, it's just intriguing to me, well, what would you do later in the waves? Because at that point, your social resources have, have gone and your PTSD is more severe. Mm -hmm. So at least from the way I understand sure. this. So okay. what, what would that potentially mean for some kind of, you know, what might be ideas yeah. of how to have innovative um, social support or social networking interventions? Because that would be further past the traumatic experience, right. most likely, right? And so, and so that would be a more, perhaps a more ingrained pattern of interacting with one's environment that uh, could be difficult to change. And those people might might drift, uh, drift off the radar. Yeah. Uh, I think um, I think in that case there might be it, it might be a sense of group-based intervention. So so in DRC, um, one of our research mentors has done a randomized clinical trial of cognitive processing therapy in DRC. And in that study, you know, I reanalyzed the outcome and looked at social re social capital. So identifying social capital as a number of different groups and individual that they were a part of. 
Um, and so people that went through the cognitive processing therapy arm actually had a significant increase in the amount of groups that they were part of. So it might be at this point, further down the, down the road, a more a targeted intervention might be more important than, than earlier. Um, and a group-based intervention might help to uh, facilitate the group dynamics for them to, re to unlearn some of the negative things they've learned about avoidance and, and, and so. Ask you a methods question and a general question. Sure. For this particular study, uh, do you know how they treated missing data? Bliss wise. I'm sorry. Bliss wise. So, so, so yeah, could you could also be getting those yeah. because people are dropping out over time. The people who are staying in are just yes, right. So you have selection bias problems with that. There? there might be bias. There might be biases by, by selection studies and also in the study that I, I presented with trajectories it was also a list wide sample as I was saying there was about 30 34 percent attrition uh, we did uh, we did analysis to identify what differences were between the attrited sample versus the sample that that uh, we analyzed uh, and there was essentially people who had higher incomes left our study earlier I don't remember what their uh, what they identified as possible possible areas of but yeah, I mean, full information, maximum likelihood estimation, or other different techniques would be even less information, less uh, observation carried forward might be a better way of approaching it than this was. The other question was, uh, this is a conflict place, right? That's what the study was on, and the other two you were talking about? This one actually was, was, was at, uh, there was a, a natural disaster in Mexico. Disaster. Yeah, and then the study that I, that I was talking about was in a conflict area. Okay, so in those, do you know what the other problems that populations were facing, like obviously sanitation issues, you know, other types of health issues. And I'm wondering, based on all those other issues that are that they're faced with, right. how do you see mental health as fitting in as a priority area for, you know, the, the health system? Right. I think, I mean, that's, that's an interesting, I mean, that's a, that's a fair question, right? But I think in, in, in the study that I showed Palestinian authority, this was post-conflict in that there was there was political violence that has occurred over time, but they weren't in a humanitarian crisis situation. So they weren't dealing with some of the things that you're that you're talking about, maybe in, a, in, a, in a, an acute post-crisis situation. There was there is water shortage. There are other issues that are happening there. But I think you know if, if you if you have a person with mental health problems and that goes untreated, they're not able to access the resources in their environment to better their circumstances. So you're talking about a population that might trip. Mental health is important in terms of uh, accessing other resources. So I, I think it, I think it's an important area where it stacks up. I mean, it depends on where they are in a, in a, in a humanitarian crisis mode. I mean, food is food, water, and, and maybe mental health after that. Right? Mm -hmm. So so, sure. so would you say that? Well, so just in my opinion, though, that <coughs> in Mexico, at least for example, if you have a natural disaster, I would imagine that the health authorities there would not put mental health as a top priority, right? Right, a safe assumption. I, I would I would say that is a safe assumption. But again, this is six months after the after the event, so some of those more critical critical um, early phase uh, emergency preparedness or emergency enactment kind of procedures should have already kind of taken place by six months after. So how do you how would you say how would you convince them that you get an added benefit by adding mental health into you know, your program of emergency response? Right. I mean, I, I think you know. I think there are there is evidence to suggest that initial uh, initial mental health care provision uh, in the near term, following major disasters and events, can influence the population over time. There's really limited things you could do for mental health in the, in the context of crisis unfolding. So the best thing you could do is, is provide good information uh, and, and provide good uh, support, offer a calming influence on an individual in that kind of in that kind of situation. But then more tertiary care models or psychological intervention wouldn't happen until we've already identified people in the population that have those issues. Uh, so in the near term, high post-traumatic stress can't be diagnosed until one month after uh, a traumatic event anyway. And so I think initially mental health problems would be a natural occurrence uh, following a lot of different trauma. Like for example, rape trauma within one month, 98%, 96, 98% of the sample can have uh, high levels of distress. But after one month, that, 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 goes, that goes down precipitously. It's a good question. Thanks. Yeah. Okay.
I want to go back to DKU for a minute. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, as you can imagine, one of our priorities uh, in the first year at DKU will be finding thesis projects in China and other parts of the world for our, let's say, our incoming class or our first class of 20 master students. Do you see uh, an opportunity for master students to get involved in these kinds of studies? And if so, what, what role would they play? Sure. I mean, I have, I have access to lots of data. And so if it was a data analytic project or a project they were interested in asking a certain question, um, it would be, I, I would be more than happy in trying to facilitate uh, access to different data sets and they could ask, ask different questions. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the criteria were, would be for a capstone project. It would be primary data collection or it would be a secondary data analysis. And Most of our students do field work and do their own primary data collection. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yes, that would that would be uh, that would be something I'd have to I'd have to think more about in terms of uh, availability of that. But I'll be in Guangzhou for a year, and I imagine that the relationships I'll be building there would be uh, would be helpful in terms of establishing that as a field site. Yeah. Uh, but secondary data analysis is, is not, not really a problem. Um, so any kind of questions that you have or they would have, I'd be able to facilitate. And I'm pretty flexible about that too. I mean, this this year I had a, a graduate student who was interested in looking at. Uh, the social ecology of, uh, of stress in, 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 uh, in Israel. I wanted to compare Israelis and, and, and Palestinian citizens of Israel, and that isn't necessarily in, in adolescence. And I haven't really necessarily looked at adolescent populations, but I was more than more than thrilled at mentoring her in that project. We've done a systematic review that should be should be submitted at some point. I'll contact her when we get back. Thanks.